how did it all get started for you? I um, was uh, in a lot of Amdram as a kid, obviously, just in the local pavilion, the local, the local sort of, you know, playing about and um, I loved it. And then I did my A-levels, theatre studies and stuff. And I went to Welsh College of Music and Drama, which is in Cardiff. And I did a degree in theatre studies and acting there. Um, showcase, agent, and then it all begins properly. Yeah. You always know you wanted to be an actor. I am one of those really annoying people that did, yeah. I, I used to, at lunch break, I used to go home across the green, very country this is, very country. I used to go back to my mum's at about sort of six or seven years old. And you could just walk across the green then in those days as well. Nobody picked me up. And uh, she would uh, make me lunch. And she'd watch Pebble Mill, which was her programme. And I would be allowed to watch Let's Pretend before I went back to school, right. which was basically this programme when I was a kid where they had this great big dressing up box and there'd be two or three of them. And they, every day, would pull out something from the dressing up box. It might be a wooden spoon, it might be a hat, it might be a dinosaur, who knows. And then they would create a play. They would improvise, basically. It was an improvisation show, but for kids. And it was just, I just thought it was the best thing ever. And I don't know whether it's connected to food and having lunch um, or just being at home and not at school or what, but they were my happiest times. And I do remember thinking, yeah, if I could just do Let's Pretend for my living, I'm going to be the happiest person alive. So, yeah. That's great. And did you always know, did you have all your sights set on what sort of actor you wanted to be? So did you know at the time you wanted to work in TV or film or theatre? Or was it just, I just want to act? I just want to act. And actually, I was talking to Charlie Brooks about this recently. I do think that, you know, I'm in my 40s now. And when, when we were all starting out, there wasn't the fame that there is now. Obviously, there's always been Hollywood megastars. That's one thing. But there was, until there was celebrity TV, there wasn't really kind of, apart from soap stars, there wasn't this hounding of people. There wasn't this, you know, Instagram life. You weren't, you weren't famous because of your name and because of your branding or anything like that, really. That wasn't part of it. It was about telling stories so, um, and pretending. So yeah, I wanted to be versatile. I wanted to be able to do all sorts, comedy, you know, drama across the board. And I, and I was really lucky actually for the first, well, I've always been lucky, but, but the first sort of four or five years for doing radio play. And then I'd go and do a bit of theater and then I'd tour for a bit and then I'd do a bit of telly and then I'd do a bit of this. And the very, you know, that's the key to life, isn't it? It's the spice yeah. of life. So, yeah. And, and you can't control anything in this industry. You can't, you know, it, it, you really can't. But what you can control, you should. And I am a bit of a control freak. So you do sometimes get the choice to go, you know, uh, you've been offered, you've just finished playing a nurse in this drama and they've offered you a nurse in this drama. And you can, you know, if you're brave, the braver option is to choose to go, okay, no, I'm going to jump off this precipice and just wait because really I've done some very serious, heavy stuff and I should do some comedy now, or I really want to go and reconnect and do a bit of new writing and do some theatre. And to make those choices and to control that stream, you do have to sometimes take some risks and, and, and risk being out of work, really. <laughs> what's, what's really interesting about your career is because all your shows, or a lot of the stuff you've done have been quite high profile, you've actually, um, you'll have sort of different sets of audiences. So you'll have people that really knew you in EastEnders and grew up with you in EastEnders. And now you're yeah. not Ackley Bridge fans. And then, I because mean, I remember when you first came into EastEnders, I, I loved uh, No Angels. Was it, it was No Angels. Yeah. And I thought you were hilarious in that. And I remember when I first met you, and I think, I remember thinking then, like, oh, God, she's a great comedy actress. And then sort of the character you played in uh, EastEnders as Tanya wasn't this uh, comedy no, story. Right. So you've got the, yeah, yeah, really. So you've got all these different sort of fan bases that you've grown along the way. It's, it's fascinating, that really. It's really lovely. I'm really lucky that. And that, again, is a bit of a choice because you kind of, you know, I'm, I'm slightly aware, before Ackley Bridge, I was slightly aware that actually my audience was growing with me, like they often do, and that now they were kind of all a bit middle-aged and I, you know, unless I'm, I'm I started... 20, to I'm 21 now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right, yes, of course, not you. You were obviously cult and ahead of your time. Um, <laughs> but, you know, to, to have Ackley Bridge has been really lovely, to have a newer, younger um, team on board, and, and it is important. And to do the variation, like you say, as soon as I came out of EastEnders, I wanted to do some comedy again because you can't stay in one place for too long because it's just not what we, any of us did this job for, you know? And um, 
I think I would find it a lot easier to stay somewhere for longer if I was doing comedy because it's just a lighter thing to be part of and I love well, it. You won, but, um, award, you won an award for comedy, didn't you? Didn't you? It just before just before I went into EastEnders, actually, I'd already accepted the part in EastEnders and then a series that I'd done for two years called Swinging on Channel 5 um, that nobody watched, but we all really enjoyed making. I mean, it was real. That was when my six-year-old self, I remember being in the makeup truck on that job and we had to, it was a sketch show. So we kind of ended up playing like 40 odd people, 40 odd different characters over the course of a series. Um, and you would, and they'd often only be in it for a second and you'd be supporting somebody else's character. So you could sort of come in on the tube in the morning and get there and, and go in rehearsals. Oh, I saw these two people today. And so I'll go into makeup and I'll go, right, so could, could you make me look like this? And she had this and she did, the, you know, and it was properly uh, creative. And, yeah. and I remember sitting in makeup one day and this fantastic makeup artist she thought and had, um, would, would just create all day long. And she'd done this great big love bite on me and we'd slap my hair up. And this was this waitress that I'd seen earlier in the day in Hackney. Um, so we were creating her and it was so much fun. I remember thinking, God, if my six or seven year old self could st was standing behind me now, she'd be going, this is it. You are getting paid to play. <laughs> and that's how it felt. But yeah, I won the Rose Door for uh, Best Comedy Performer that year. And, um, and then went into EastEnders and didn't laugh at all for years. <laughs> How long were you in EastEnders for? Uh, gosh, I think eight years all in all. Yeah. yeah. I went in for, I tried to go in for two and they asked for three. I went in for three and then um, their life takes over yeah. and I had babies and it just wasn't the time to um, go gallivanting off. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of your career, when you... Because, you, as I said, you've played all these different roles. You've played all these different roles. How, would you, how do you go about preparing? How do you go about preparing for a role? So what's your process, as it were? Um, I, well, if it's, if it's theatre, then you, you know, you'll, well, you always start with the script from any sense anyway. Um, I'll go through my script work and I will... Um, work on the character first, really. I'll look at what people say about that character and I'll make a note of that. I'll look at what that character says themselves, whether they mean it, how they're feeling, what kind of person they are, whether they, you know, oh, when she gets in, in this area, she, she's feeling awkward, she doesn't shut up. She says this, but actually she behaves like that, so she doesn't mean it, she's this kind of person, you know, all those sorts of things. Then I'll go through the script again and I'll look at the kind of, um, uh, the any other detail about their house, where they live or their clothes, their style of music, all those things that create a person. And then very often for the physical stuff and for before I go and talk to costume and makeup, I will often, it's very rare that I find one person that I'll base it on, but there will always be one or two people in my life. And sometimes they might even just be an acquaintance, a friend of a friend's that I've met two or three times who's got mannerisms or something that I go, ah, oh, that's very similar. And she never shuts up when she's like this. So maybe, yeah, I'm gonna take that thing she does with her hair, you know, something like that. So then you'll, you know, you'll, you'll think of other people around you, like Beth from No Angels. There were a couple of things there were two people. Now, I don't want to mention them because they're so private. It's yeah. very private. Yet you wouldn't want anyone to know. Go on. And it's not, <laughs> not necessarily. It's not necessarily like you end up mimicking them, but you definitely, you know, you take some of their attributes and gestures and things, and and then add them in the part. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So you draw. So that's where I start. The character, the character's really important for you. Before is that is that the same for TV stuff you've done? Do you, is do you approach TV differently to how you approach theatre? It's definitely, well, what's lovely about theatre is that you find that you've got a longer rehearsal process and a longer collaboration period. And from my experience in theatre, you'll get a truer image of what I was going to do with that part and what I've created. Um, and in TV, you have to adapt it very often because costume and I, you know, I might then meet costume and we might get buzz and go, oh yes, that's exactly what I thought. And yes, yeah, she's like this. And then and you have a really easy session. And then they might call and say, the execs and the producers don't like this color palette. They don't want her in these things. They want her more like this. And sometimes it can be really different to what you decided. 
And very often, actually, it might be very similar to something that you played before. And so the, the, the execs and the channel are possibly going, well, we want that person because that fits here. Mm -hmm. And you're going, no, this is what I thought of the part. And you, you know, and then you have to decide whether you're going to battle with them, how much they want you, how much you want that part <laughs> to be like that. Or they might have a better suggestion. You might end up coming away with, yeah, you know, having spoken to makeup and costume and all gone, yeah, actually, okay, let's go in this direction. And, you know, they have to create this whole other palette for their TV series. Um, and, you know, now that I'm older and wiser, I am braver at, at, at pulling a take straight away and going, can, sorry, can we do that again? <laughs> uh, I'm not happy with that. Which you, it, 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 you do have to be brave to do that on a, a TV set, you know, because time is money. And, um, and so, you know, you don't ever want to be the reason that we're having to go again. You know that. Um, so, and I hate getting in people's way or, you know, feeling like that. So I, so I very often wouldn't. And, and actually that's complacent because it's out there then. And you, you, you need to, yeah, there's nothing worse than that feeling of coming away at the end of the day, go, didn't get that, did we, didn't get that. I, 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 but once, only once in eight years at EastEnders did we, Jake and I both went back and asked to reshoot something, which we'd never done before. It was a particularly hard scene and um, it was quite a theatrical scene that Simon Ash Ashford had written. And, it, you know, he, he's fantastic. And he, it was, it was this great duologue, but they were, it was very theatrical. It was slightly heightened. It wasn't, you know, it was, it was hard to get it right. And it was later after he'd been seeing another woman and we, we weren't actually together at the time. It was in our bedroom. And it was really weird. This is really weird. So these are some of the character things that people do. But um, Jake is um, an actor who, I hope you wouldn't mind me saying this, he wears different scent for people he's playing or at different times. Um, and so he had a particular aftershave for Max. We'd never mentioned that. So they, we, we must have been about six or seven years in by now. Um, and I'd never mentioned it, but I knew Max's smell. You know, and it wasn't like outside of work, I'd noticed that Jake smelled different. So I probably don't get that close to him outside of work. <laughs> but, you know, I, I had never really noticed it. But we were in this scene and I thought it, we just weren't nailing it. it. We couldn't get it going. And I just couldn't, I don't know what had happened, but it wasn't working. Anyway, we came away, we had to move on for the day, go and do other stuff. And it was really bothering me. It was bothering me all afternoon. And, and I thought, I feel a bit stupid. Could I actually say this to him? But he smelt different and it was really through me. It was really putting me off, right? And I thought it can't, it can't be, but I'm sure he did. I'm sure he did. And I've got a really strong sense of it. Anyway, later on that afternoon, we saw each other that evening, I think, and, and uh, both sort of really, sort of, I think we, neither of us wanted to say I really, but I went, we didn't really get that, did we? And he was like, we didn't, we didn't get it, did we? We didn't. I'm thinking, should we go back and ask to reshoot it? And I went, I think so, but but still, how are we going to get it? And I said, Jake, I'm going to say something really stupid now. Have you changed your aftershave? And he went, yeah, I changed it because I'm with another woman now. He's with Zoe Lucker, I think, in the story. He went, so I, I've been wearing a different aftershave because I'm with her for him. And I went, it really threw me. And he was like, we, we'd never mentioned it. He was like, I didn't know you knew I wore one. I went, well, nor did I really. It was just that when we were having that, we couldn't quite get it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how pathetic. But <laughs> of me, I mean, not of him. But yeah, it turned out it was all his fault. His fault, there you go. <laughs> sometimes what's more confusing is sometimes you really think you've nailed something and you watch it back and you haven't. And that's more worrying, really. Or, you, or something that you thought was terrible take, you watch it and you go, wasn't that bad actually yeah. you know I, mean, it, I actually don't watch I don't watch a huge amount of it back now all the time because because I do find it confusing because <laughs> I'm not always right as it turns out and, and do you have, what about sort of particular roles so you, you say you draw upon sort of experiences and people when you in Ackley Bridge for example you play a head teacher now I, I've been a teacher and when I watched the show sort of I was I was thinking then I was thinking how's has she spoken to teachers? Have you, have you, did you go and observe a school? Like what, what did you do when you took that role on? Did you speak to your husband? Well, here's, here's a lesson, right? <laughs> the fact is, the bottom line is, I'm not the writer. So there's always going to be things, um, 
not so easy in a soap or something that's that's such a massive vehicle it's running at such a speed that you haven't possibly got time to go and amend scripts with producers but on something like Acura Bridge or a series like that there is time for me to go and question something there's time for me to maybe send a memo upstairs and go really would I be on my own in the room with the door shut should we consider this Ooh. for safeguarding really you know because my husband's a teacher as well yeah. my best friend is a teacher um so you know odd things like that can be tweaked along the way for sure but ultimately her major decisions that might put the school in jeopardy I'm not in charge of they're a storyline and I'm not the writer so I knew that there was kind of no point in me researching teaching because I would just be annoying the directors and producers all the time who are trying to make a program and a drama out of something you know it's like those um, those murder programs where they go you don't ha you wouldn't have a village that had so many murders of course you wouldn't right but that's what the story is so we have to yeah. put that in and you maybe wouldn't have a head teacher who made so many mistakes or did so many stupid things but this is a drama and we have to kind of you know follow it so I didn't research for her but I will tell you one research story that that haunts me <laughs> when we were starting No Angels the nursing show you were talking about that I was in in my 20s with Sinetra Saka who's also in uh, at Bridge. we did have a full day of shadowing nurses in Leeds, in hospital in Leeds. And um, I shadowed this amazing nurse and she didn't stop. And it was a real education. And that was definitely useful because there were going to be practical things we were doing, like putting IV drips in and things like that, that actually, you know, practically speaking, it was going to be useful to, to do that, which you wouldn't have with teaching. But, um, but equally, you know, it was good to see the pressures and, and how the place worked and, and how they never stopped and everything. But this girl was so conscientious and brilliant. And at the time, I knew that the part I was going to be playing, the nurse I was playing, Beth, would, would get out of any work at, at any notice and would rather be doing her nails, reading a magazine and trying to find a rich doctor, which was, couldn't have been more opposite to this gorgeous girl who was with me all day. And as we left at the end of the day, and I was going, oh, thanks so much. It's been really useful following you. She was like, oh, it's great. Can't wait to see myself. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> like, oh, okay, bye. <laughs> Please don't think that's what I think of you. So She's yeah, she's going, going to work and consult. This this part was based on me. This part was based on me. Watch. <laughs> that is exactly what I was horrified about. I thought, Please don't be sitting there with it, having told your friends and family that I based this part of you because I don't write it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's funny. Um, so, Joe, in terms of, so you've got a part now. So if it's theatre, you do lots of character work. If it's TV, you still do that element of character work, but obviously it's more fast paced. So there's other people making decisions for you. Um, what, what challenges would you face? So somebody watching the online theatre score, listening in, what challenges would you say face that they, that they might come across as an actor or somebody working in the industry? And how to prepare for those challenges? Um, I think it's really important to remain flexible and then um, I can almost feel <laughs> a past director of mine laughing at this going what like you <laughs> um, because sometimes you can feel so passionately about a, a part and a, and a thing and a moment that you're creating um, you really have to choose your battles and you can't be too precious and the director's there to look at the entire thing from outside and to make the entire thing work, which is absolutely what your overall mission should be as well. And, you know, not just your character's journey, what yeah. will serve the piece and what will help him. And so in order to do that, you've got to be flexible. And very often you'll be asked to try something or do something. Um, not so much in theatre, because I think in theatre, when they ask you to do something different, we all know it's past, part of the rehearsal process. And if it's awful, we won't keep it, we'll throw it away. But mm. with TV, if it's awful, there's always the chance they'll keep it because they've got it on camera. <laughs> and it's not, you know, you're not in the edit. Um, uh, well, actually, if, unless you're a Hollywood star and you probably are. Um, but um, yeah, so I think it's really important. Or one of the things that I come up against sometimes is, is a director, asking you to try something that's that feels completely opposite to the journey you were taking and so a you're not sure how to to do it well um but also you start thinking you start getting insecure and thinking well you haven't you, you don't agree with how i'm doing this at all then my god if that's if that's the angle you're coming at then you must think my performance is awful because this is where i'm going um but 
that just ties you up in knots. It's, it's going to get and nobody anywhere. And you have to be able to have a go at it. And you, you know, part of your job is to get a difficult line that isn't working. And if nobody wants to change it and nobody's in agreement, you make it work, right? That's part, that's what you're getting paid to do. And so you're also getting paid to, to try something and, and you may well find that they were right and you may find something fabulous and very often in theatre you do when you go to a different extreme um but it but you feel braver possibly it's a slightly safer environment so it's, it's than, than a tv set it's because it's so moving there it's a balance i suppose then between maintaining some integrity and your craft as an actor but also that flexibility that you need to just realize is part and parcel i suppose it's when someone when writers have to hand over their work seeing it being edited and script edited and all those sort of things it must be painful at first but it's just about it it's exactly that you you put it much better than i do lawrence it's exactly that it's maintaining your integrity and the truth of what you're doing finding the truth in what you've been asked to do and having a go at it and you know some of your best directors will end up you know asking you several things and then go yeah no, let's go back to yours or no, that didn't work. But, you know, and you feel comfortable doing that with them. But, um, you know, it, it's about collaborating and being open to that, to find, to find great things. Yeah, sure. In other interviews, we spoke about the element of knockbacks and rejection. And I think it's the number one fear that sort of young actors have, or to be fair, all actors have of going through that process. How have you found that in your journey as an actor in terms of the, the knockbacks and how do you deal with that side of things and in general how do you look after your mental health um as well as your physical health big questions lawrence big questions <laughs> i i have to say that just as you never stop getting nervous you know i remember one of my earliest jobs um what, what, called pretending to be judith it was christine Tramarco was the main part and i was a, I, I was a sales assistant so I don't even know. I was at the read through for a jolly, really. I was just too excited. I, I literally had one line. I shouldn't have been there probably. Um, but uh, there was Christopher Plummer was my granddad. I'm just going to drop a few names here. Hey, Kenneth Cranham was my dad. Maybe you know, we should have these along the bottom. <laughs> you could, please, yeah. Um, and uh, Edward Woodward was in it as well. I mean, there was a, you know, a wealth of fabulous um, uh, people in it. And, and I was just so nervous. I could have just thrown up every second rather than say my first line at the read through, you know, and I was sat there and Edward Woodward came in and he got a coffee and he sat down next to me. And uh, he just turned to me and said, never gets any easier, does it? These things always nerve wracking. And I just thought, oh my God, yeah. really? Edward Woodward is feeling as nervous as I am. And um, it made me feel a lot better about the whole thing. But in the same way, you were asking, well, I don't know where I've gone right round in the houses now because I didn't sleep well last night. Um, but, but what I think I'm trying to say is that it, uh, you, you are always just as nervous and knockbacks are always just as painful if you let them be. Um, and in fact, they get bigger because they're often for an even bigger job than you ever dreamed of. And, you know, the, the stakes get higher and you know, when you're down to the last two, it's you and definitely somebody you've heard of. It's not, you know, it, in the early days, you'll be down to the last two or three and, you know, it's all to play for. And now you're down to the last two or three and you go, oh, she's great. Oh, she's great. Oh. <laughs> you know, but it's still, um, it's not a rejection. I think the way I've always handled it is not to take it personally. I was very lucky early on to be an out of work actor that you sometimes used to get paid 50 quid a day at Spotlight by a casting person to come and read in for people. So, you know, it's a sad affair because basically somebody fabulous like Sally Wainwright in this instance has written a fabulous piece for Sarah Smart, brilliant actress. Um, and Sarah was so busy working while I wasn't that she couldn't come and read for her male counterpart, right? So I got paid 50 quid to come in and, and be on that side of the panel for the day. And I think it was one of the biggest lessons I ever had in the industry because I was with these great producers and a lovely director and a fabulous writer and casting director. And I was on the other side of the desk and I was reading one after another with all these great male actors um, uh, that I won't, I won't name them, but you know, they were coming in and they, you know, they were all, there was a, 
a whole mixture of some that we'd never heard of or seen at that point, some that we really knew really well, some that were, you know, famous people's kids that were being asked to be seen. You know, there was a real mixture. Yeah, yeah. And what was a real treat was to see how everybody on that side of the desk wanted the next person to come in to be the person for the job. Whereas I think when you go for an audition, you're thinking, are oh, they going to want me? Oh God, they're going to think this, they're going to think that. Well, no, actually they've been working on this baby for three years by now and they cannot wait for Mandy to walk in the door or, you know, Trevor to come in. You know, they are all keen for you to get this part as well, which was something I'd never really thought of. And then when you leave the room, they're not all going, oh God, that was awful. The way she did that, why does she do that? I don't know, she's too yeah. fat, she's too small. But it, that, which is what you, again, Think is happening when you leave a room it's not what's happening is they're either going I'm not sure that you could put him next to so-and-so and they'd look like brothers no but it, he was great wasn't it yeah but he's not yeah it's that simple and once you hear them going they're looking for a combination of stuff that they you very often they see brilliant people and you're just they've already cast the mum and dad you're not going to work with the mum and dad that's just that's just luck right there's nothing you can do about that and it, it made, it took a lot of the personal stuff out of it for me and it really taught me that you, you can't take it personally. The minute I walk out of a place, I throw the script away. That's a little habit I have. And um, I try not to think of it until I hear anything because you just have to move on to the next, 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 next. Yeah. But that's really interesting because, because you had the opportunity to be on the other side of the desk as a, on the casting side you could then see the reality of what actually happens in those rooms. And I love this. Well, exactly. Yeah, somebody else said when they were being interviewed about this idea, they don't see it as rejection. They just see it as part of the job. And it's, you've just got to get that mindset as, as difficult as it is, it is. It's absolutely right. And you can't, what, what's it going to be? I'm a very positive person. So, I mean, look, you know, even that scenario, I could stay and mope about the fact that one of my peers, who's a fabulous actress, is having stuff written for her and, you know, and she's so busy she can't even read for the leading man. What a, you know, and instead of, you know, I'm not, I'm just here being paid for doing you're not. You're there going, well, this is a great opportunity. Yeah. I'm still reading this fabulous writing. I'm still in a room with all these brilliant people. I'm getting paid 50 quid today, so that's a bonus. And, <laughs> you know, what can I learn from the experience? Yeah. And onward and upward, isn't it? And the second part of the question was, as you said, quite a, 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 a big question, but how do you look after your mental health as well as your physical health? Simple country things. I garden. I love gardening. And I used to garden a lot when I was younger, when I got my first house, before I had kids. If I was out of work, just weeding is really simple, but really peaceful. Are it's you, really peaceful. Are you free next weekend? Because mine could do <laughs> weeding. <laughs> Listen, you can't even be bothered to cook for yourself. So I'm, I'm not, <laughs> until you learn to do that, Lawrence, I'm not doing your weeding. I've got um, that out of the interview. <laughs> yeah, do. Um, and crafting. So I've been, I've had my sewing machine out, which I haven't had out for 22 years. And um, I've been making masks for friends and family and people that I know. And uh, so I've been doing sewing and gardening at the moment. Normally, for me, mental health is really important to have a routine. I think when you've been doing theatre, when you're a young student, it's so easy to burn the candle at both ends and suddenly find you're in lockdown, going to bed at two in the morning, not getting up till two in the afternoon. Probably like you, Lauren. Nah. Right. I mean, I don't know what's happening here. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but you can, you can find yourself, you, you lose all sense of routine and that, that's never good for my mental health. That, it, a, a regular exercise, even if it's just walking, if I'm not doing a workout, those are the things I would do anyway when I'm up and running and working but now I'm not working it's been really peaceful and calm you know because we're, we're worried about our industry aren't we we're worried about whether I, I'm in a really fortunate position at the moment Touchwood in that a I'm not brassic my husband's a key worker so we're okay but also um I, I have got supposedly I've got work for the next seven months you know lined up and I've got a job to finish and another one to do once we finish this but um so it's a it's a i've got room to be peaceful in my mind and do some gardening and, and chill out a bit but i know that's a really privileged place to be because i know that if i hadn't i know that after that i'm all right i'm a forward planner and after that i am going oh poor theaters 
which ones are going to survive? How are they going to survive? How are we going to get them back up and running? How are we going to get filming back up and running, really, without without jeopardizing some of our kind of um, more vulnerable people that we might work with, you know? No, it's, it's true. It's, it's, it, these are such surreal times. And um, I think I think you picked up on something there that despite your level of success or so whether or not you're starting out or whether or not you're doing very well or, or whatever part of your career, I think it's really important to take moments to look after your mental health. So for you, maybe that, that weeding or exercise or, or um, sewing, but for someone else, it might be different. But I think anyone at any stage of their career, and regardless of where they are, needs, needs to take, take care of themselves. They do. And I especially with social media now and the sort of constant, uh, you said something earlier that I found interesting. The, the difference between acting now and then is that you are now the brand. So before you could sort of be the actor and then sort of close your door and, and, and then you got on with your life. Whereas now an actor needs to be an actor and almost a brand. Like their Instagram is just as, as big as their part. Yeah, it's true. It's true. And I don't, I don't do that particularly. And I don't do it very well because I don't, um, I don't think it's healthy. Mm. I'd rather focus on the work and, and stuff but you know but it is each to their own for sure and if I you know maybe I wouldn't if I knew how to use it better I would but I I did that's another thing I do do for my mental health you know like I just had three days off of all of it right not looking at it not trolling through it because it was just so negative and yeah. it and everybody else seems to be doing far more you know surely I should have come out of lockdown having written a play written a novel produced something you know well, no, I haven't. I've been, I've taught my kids. I've enjoyed spending time with them because that's not something I get to do quite quite as often as most. And I've been gardening. I tell you what, I, I would say to anybody who is suffering mentally at the moment, please try growing some veg because even if it's something you've never ever thought of and you only have a room for a window box, it's so hopeful and positive at this time to have this sort of there's something really good about getting your hands dirty to have this dark moist earth that looks like nothing is going to happen. And it just, as you think after sort of, you know, 10, 11 days, you're going, well, I obviously didn't do that. Right. Nothing happening there. There's just this little bit of green and this little bit of hope and this little bit, you know, and it, and I can it's honestly for these times, it's really hopeful and positive and it will make you feel better. I love this idea of people coming onto the online theater school, um, to, 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 to sort of get an insight into uh, the- industry. Growing some veg. Growing veg. I mean, these are all great things that, I, and I don't believe it. I think it's, it's, it's great. And, it, and I think it's really important for people to speak out about this stuff because too often people think that being an actor is 24 seven, amazing job, you know, the, the money and the fame. But actually the reality is sometimes actors are very, very sad and very, and struggle greatly with their mental health. I think we've seen that. I think I think they do more often than not, particularly comedy actors or, or comedians that I know seem to really struggle more. And I think it's because uh, that 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 personality that that makes you um, really sociable and really thrive off company of other people. And you know, uh, you and I always have a really good laugh when we see each other, and always go, "Why don't we do it more than every ten years?" <laughs> But you know, because we're those sorts of personalities that actually, um, I've been quite surprised how well I've done away from my social. But actually it's because I've used Zoom a lot more and it's opened up. My friends are all over the country like most are nowadays, aren't they? So it, we've learned a valuable lesson. that I don't have to wait six months before I meet the No Angels girls for dinner. If we can't all match up our diaries, we can just have a Zoom evening and it will last till two in the morning and it'll be just as successful. So, um, you know, these are good things to learn, aren't they? So to wrap it up, Joe, I asked this question of all our interviewees, which is if you could offer two or three top tips for anybody thinking about getting into the industry, what would they be? So I would say uh, keep positive and don't take things personally. Um, uh, create. Be creative whenever you can, if you possibly can, be creative um, with your choices and, and take control of the, ch the things you can take control of because it will, it will make you stronger in a way. You know, if you, if you can make decisions that are brave, make them. Make them before you have mortgage and children because 
because they're so much easier to make and you know he who dares wins right there we go <laughs> joe thank you so much for joining us it's been an absolute pleasure and we'd love to catch up with you, you. At some point. um see you soon thank you very much please do subscribe the online theater school has lots of lessons coming your way as well as interviews with people from film theater and television see you soon